Good morning, and welcome to the September 30th, 2019 Utah Division of uh, Drinking Water webinar. We have Reed Hendricks with us from Chemtech Ford Laboratory today to talk about sampling and the basics of sampling correctly. Uh, this is a webinar topic that we've wanted to cover for a long time. Uh, you probably all noticed that we did not have a live one. We were again hampered by the removal of the Google software that we'd used for so long to promote and run our webinars, but we have purchased new software. We're just getting it through the final installation requirements with DTS, but it's going to be a big enhancement on our normal webinar procedure. Uh, there'll be a few changes to it, uh, to how you interact with our webinars, but it's going to make them more dynamic. It's going to make it easier for you to access and find them, and then we'll still be publishing them to YouTube. Uh, this webinar will be published, is published to YouTube. You've got a link to it to view it there, and the quiz will all be embedded there and ready for you to go. Again, apologies for not being able to get it to you live today, but this is a life in show business, such as it were. A <laughs> couple of quick reminders. They're the same as last time. Lead and copper sampling um, is <laughs> lead and copper sampling is still going. DBP sampling, IPS 2020 comments. We are halfway through the IPS 2020 comment period. Uh, our October webinar will have a more in-depth analysis and coverage of IPS 2020, and that'll be the first one using our new GoToWebinar software. I'm excited for you to, to interact with that. I think it's going to be a really big advancement and help us continue to increase the uh, proficiency we have for operators across the state of Utah. Uh, some upcoming trainings. The Utah Rural Water Association has their Fall Wastewater Operator Certification in Utah County, uh, October 15th through the 17th. Uh, those same days in Grantsville, there's a Cross Connection Control Program Administrator Certification. This is reflective of a change to the Cross Connection Control Rule. Uh, go back and look at our Cross Connection webinar conducted by Gary Rager earlier this year if you have questions on that. And then if you've watched that and you still have questions, go ahead and contact Gary. But if you are a system that needs an administrator, this is a big opportunity for you. If you're in the southern part of the state, that same training an administrative certification program is happening the 22nd through the 24th in St. George. October 22nd, there's a hydrants, valves, and source protection training. There's not a lot of details on that available, but contact the Utah Rural Water Association for follow-up. And then October 23rd to the 25th, you can come see me in Weber County uh, conduct in the rural section of the Fall Water Operator Certification Training Program. Uh, there's another one in November, I know, coming up that we'll cover uh, in Utah County, and I believe those are the big ones for the fall. Uh, if you have questions on those, get in touch with Utah Rural Water, reach out to us. Uh, fire and Water, the battle between, the, it is the fall, the annual conference for the American Water Works Intermountain Section, taking place in Sun Valley, Idaho, October 9th to the 11th. I know there are some members of our staff that are going there. A number of our water systems will be there. And that's a great conference in a gorgeous location. If you're able to attend, uh, please enjoy and report back on all of the happenings that happen there. That's always a great conference that talks a lot about some of the cutting edge stuff that's happening in water. And as we know, there's a lot of new emerging contaminants. There's a lot of proposed new regulations. There's a lot of things happening uh, with water. Uh, that's in the water science that's coming up. So please, uh, if you're able to attend, let us know on that one. All right, and with that, I will get ready to turn it over to Reed. Reed, you work with Chemtech Ford Laboratory here in Salt Lake City. Uh, you do a lot of sampling around the state, and like I said, this is a webinar topic we've wanted to cover for a long time because it is so fundamental to maintaining compliance and to maintaining water quality is getting good samples and understanding those basics. So with that, uh, let us know if you have questions that you don't have answers to. Obviously, you can't do them live because this is recorded, but go ahead and let us know in the comments section and we will reply to those and get those questions to Reed and he was really good at responding to those. All right, and with that, Reed, I'll, uh, I'll drive a lot of work and you can just tell me when you want me to click forward. All right, very good, thank you. Can you see that? Yeah, go ahead and go forward. So we're going to talk about everything you need to know to submit your samples to a laboratory. And um, 
this this is a little bit more than simply filling up the the bottles and giving them back to us there's a few details you want to know so we're going to talk about how to take your samples how to fill out your chain of custody and how to understand your report once you get it back so let's go ahead and go next there Colt. now one thing we're not going to cover this this presentation assumes you you already know how to go to waterlink and assess what your needs are now if that is not true if, if you need help with that my advice is first go to waterlink.utah.gov and play around with that it's pretty self-explanatory but if you're new or you hate computers and and um, you have some questions the number for the state is right there if you want to talk to someone at the state or alternatively you can call the lab that second number ctf that stands for chemtech ford we're happy to answer your questions the only caveat I would give is that we, we are one of a number of private labs that you can use for your testing. We're not affiliated with the state, so we can't, we have no authorities to grant, grant variances or ask, answer questions that are you know, beyond the scope of the routine monitoring, but we do a lot of water testing in Utah. We, we know the regulations pretty well, so we're happy to answer any questions you have. There, you can also go back and view the WaterLink 101 webinar that we conducted in 2018, as well as the webinar on the WaterLink portal. So you can search right here on this YouTube page or wherever you're watching this webinar to find uh, the basics of that and watch the video on how to use WaterLink too to get those basics. It's right there too. Very good. So let's more plug to boost up my viewership. <laughs> let's go on and go to, go to the next slide then. So one concept you need to understand is there's two different categories of places where you might take your samples. One is the distribution system and the other is the source. Now your distribution system is defined as any place where a user turns on a faucet and gets water. It can be a fire hydrant, it can be a bathtub, a drinking fountain, whatever. The other place would be your source. Um, source. Most of you have a well as your source. Some people have streams or, or lakes or what have you. And when you go to WaterLink, the testing that is required on the distribution system will be listed first, and then it will list all your sources. So let's go on to the next slide, Colt. The things that you need to take from the distribution system include your monthly bacteria, and that comes from whatever spots are listed on your sampling plan. Lead and copper, of course, that comes from individuals' homes. Um, the disinfection byproducts comes from a specific place in your distribution system, either the midpoint or, or the oldest water. And so those, of course, come th from the distribution system. Asbestos, in rare cases, uh, there's only about 25 people, I think, that maybe 40 that, that I'm aware of that had to do that. And that you'd, you'd look on WaterLink to see where you take that. The um, other place where you take samples would be the source, and that's just about everything else. If it's not from, if it's not one of those we mentioned, you take it directly from your source. So let's go on and talk about how you take your samples. There are two tests where it's really important that you get the sampling right. And so let's talk a little bit about those two. One, the first one is your monthly bacteria. In this case, it's really easy to get a false positive. And if you don't really have coliform, you don't wanna to have to go back and do the follow-up testing. It's a real pain. So here's the bottle you're gonna use for bacteria testing. A Couple of things to point out. Um, it's got a protective bit of plastic around the Thing to protect dirty fingers from touching the interface. It's got a little bit of powder down here in the, bo in the bottom. Uh, right there. Click, that'll draw. If I click, oh, there you go. Hey, that's cool. We get to do arts and crafts. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. So down there, there's a little bit of powder. That The job of that is to remove any excess chlorine that might be in your sample. And right here is the line that tells you how much to fill it up. So first of all, if I was taking this, 
I would start by cleaning the faucet that I'm going to take it from. If it's an outdoor faucet and a dog came by and licked it or it, just a kitchen faucet and, and people got their grummy fingers on it, you, you don't want to get bacteria from the faucet because you're testing the water itself. So I would, I would take a rag with a bit of bleach water and clean that faucet really well. After that, you want to turn it on and flush it, run it for a couple of minutes, and then fill it up to this line. Do not put the lid down, especially peanut butter side down, because you can pick up bacteria from the faucet. Don't touch the threads of the lid. Don't touch the any, any part of the bottle that might get bacteria from your fingers onto the bottle. And like I say, fill it up to that line, and then it does need to be sent to us on ice. That's the main deal there. The other one that people need to get right or, or it's not going to work is the volatile organics. And the criteria there is you cannot have any headspace. So what does that mean? Imagine a two liter bottle of soda pop, how as soon as you open it up, it goes and all the CO2 flies out immediately. Well, suppose you poured a, a small drink out of that two liter bottle and then you cap it up again. If you undo the cap right away, it's not going to fizz again. But if you cap it up again and you let it set for an hour, what will happen is the volatiles will want to form an equilibrium between the vapor phase and the liquid phase. And so an hour later, you come and open that up again, psh, it, they're going to fly out as soon as you open that lid. And so that's the same concept with the volatile organics that you're going to do. We want, if there's any air bubble at all, the volatiles, some of the volatiles are going to fly away as soon as you open it and you'll reject it. Or the lab, we, we will reject that and make you sample it again. So the way to do that, this is an example of a container. This is a 40 milliliter glass vial. You want to fill it to where it's over, almost overflowing right there. See, it's, it looks like it's just about to fill over. Then you put the lid on. And after you put the lid on, turn it upside down and look for any air bubbles. Now here's an example of one that we would reject because it's got too much headspace. So if you see if you see this, turn it over, fill it up a little, put a few more drops in and, uh, and try it again. Um, if, if there's a lot of air in your water, if, it, if you observe this kind of cloudy at first and then it, the cloudiness goes away after you set it for a minute, you might have a problem with headspace forming a little bit as it sits there. So if that's the case, wait a minute, before, wait a little bit before you pack it up and see if any headspace develops. And if it does, add some more in. Remember, the important thing is over time, the volatiles will go into the headspace and leave. And, and uh, that would cause your sample to be rejected and you have to do it again. Here's, here's an example of the kit you will get for the volatile organics. Notice that there's two bottles. The reason for that is we need an extra one in case one breaks or if one fails quality control parameters and we have to run it again. So in this case, what you do is you fill the bottles up about three quarters full and you'll notice there's a, there's a medicine dropper there and there's a, a little bottle Okay, I'm, I'm not very good at drying. I, I failed the drying in kindergarten. There's your medicine dropper. And that little bottle is, is acid. So what you do when it's three quarters full, you'll put five drops of hydrochloric acid into it, then fill it the rest of the way full and do the thing like we just showed you. Turn it upside down and check for headspace. This is what you'd get for your disinfection byproducts you'd get these five bottles and you'll notice that three of them are amber and two of them are clear. The clear ones are for the volatile portion of the disinfection byproduct. So it's the same thing as I just showed you in the last slide. The only exception is you don't need to add the acid if you're doing the disinfection byproducts. The amber ones are for what I would call the semi-volatile portion of your disinfection byproducts, the haloacetic acids. 
they do not require that they be filled without headspace. But if I was you, I would fill them without headspace anyway. And just so you know, we need 40 milliliters, which is about right to that lip. So we need at least that much for the extraction for the HAs. And like I say, the THMs, the volatiles, they have to be filled with no headspace. And all five of those correspond to one location. The drinking water pesticides is actually divided into four different tests. So you're, you're going to have eight bottles here. They're all amber, so that you don't have the headspace requirement. But again, fill them up as full as you can. For, for, for these big ones, we use a liter. And a liter is about right there. So make sure it's at least that full. And these, I, what I would do if I was you, any of the 40 milliliter vials, I'd just fill them up without any headspace. It's cheap insurance to do them all that way. But for the drinking water pesticides, we won't reject it if it has headspace because these are, these are not volatiles. Here's what you'd get if you're doing the inorganics and metals. Now, the key to these is just fill it mostly full. Never rinse out the bottle. If you think, well, I'm going to rinse the bottle with my water just to make sure. No, what you that would be bad because most of these bottles have preservatives that have to be there. In the case of the, the metals bottle here, it's got a red sticker on the lid indicating nitric acid. This one here is for cyanide. It has sodium hydroxide in it. If you rinse those out, you'll lose them. But the other thing is don't overfill these because you don't want to spill nitric acid on your hands. That would be unpleasant. If you do, rinse it off really well for 10 minutes and you'll be fine. You're not going to die, but it would be unpleasant. So these three bottles correspond to the inorganics and metals. We need all three of them. If you're doing radiologicals, you'll get these two half gallon containers. We need them both. Don't If you have two wells and we send you four bottles. Don't don't take one for one well and the other and for the other well and then save save the two extras. No, we need both bottles for one sample. Here's what you'd use for your lead and copper sampling. If you're doing lead and copper in your homes, you use this quart bottle here, the one on the left without any acid in it. This one. And the reason. For that is we don't want homeowners to have bottles with nitric acid in it. We'll add the nitric acid when we get it to the lab. And the other one is if you're doing like arsenic at your source or something like that. Let's talk about holding times. The definition of a holding time is once you fill up that bottle, we've got a certain amount of time that we have to start the test. Bacteria, your monthly bacteria has the shortest holding time. We need to start the test within 24 hours. Now, actually, the, the, the code says 30 hours, but we tell people 24 because we don't want to get too close to that. Nitrate, which is a yearly requirement on your source, you've only got 48 hours, so you got to get that to us quickly. Um, and and you, you can just read there. I, won't, I don't feel the need to read that all to you. Now, the pesticides, volatiles, and disinfection byproducts, you've got 14 days. However, they, need, they do need to be kept cool during transport. So even though, I mean, you, you might say, okay, I'm going to take my pesticides on Friday. I'm not going to ship them till Monday. But you should, if you use shipping instead of driving them to the lab, you should use overnight shipping because otherwise the ice will melt and it won't make it under the right temperature parameters. Lead and copper and radiologicals are the only ones that you can ship not on ice. Everything else I, th I think you need to get it to us that same day or, or if you're shipping the next day. Here's an example of a cooler that wasn't packed super well. You see it's jostled around a little bit. Um, if you've ever worked at a UPS or know someone who has, you know they're not really gentle with their packages. so. Assume the worst and pack it really tight. This one, you know, it could have used some more packing on top. And um, when they're packing with ice, is there? I, I mean, you may cover this in a future slide. And if you do, just let me know. But I know I've heard some operators talk about not using just loose ice throughout there. 
because it can we prefer we prefer blue or, ice or blue ice yes. ice packs better so that yes. there's less of a chance of the ice water then seeping into the that 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 is absolutely correct okay. yeah, that, that is preferable to use um, ice packs rather than actual ice okay let's move on to how do you fill out your chain of custody it is really important that first of all you include a chain of custody and they, that you fill it out properly. It's that your chain of custody is your legal um, contract with the lab where you tell us what you want tested for. So let's go over a few features of the chain of custody. There's many different formats of chains of custody. If you've seen different laboratories, we're going to discuss chains of custody using our format. I, I believe the one we use at Chemtech Ford is pretty much an, an industry standard, but basic features of a chain of custody all chains of custody will have a place where you need to tell us who you are of course and one thing i'm going to note about here the contact information what i want you to put here is the person that will be able to answer questions if we have if we have them if you have some kid whose job is simply to fill up the bottles and bring them in i don't want his name there there's a different place for him to put his name here I want the person that that's going to receive the report and the person that we can call if there's questions. Other features of a chain of custody. This is not common to any test other than drinking water, but for drinking water, put your state system number and do you want us to send it to the state? That's very important because we're not going to we can send the data over to the state's database rather seamlessly if you tell us to if you don't we won't and if you're doing an investigative sample that's just for your own for in for your own information click no other features of the chain is you've got to tell us what test you want us to do and we use what i'd call the grid format here where you write your tests right here and then you'll put an X indicating which test you want. So in this example, for the Gungan well, they want all four, all five of these tests, the RADs, volatile, and so forth. However, on the backup well, they only want the nitrate and they indicated so by putting an X only by there and not the others. That's kind of the basic feature. And I know some laboratories use a different format, but that's that's how you do ours. Of course, you need to tell us, that highlighted in yellow there, what the name of your well is. The date and time sample is hugely important because holding time in compliance is determined by looking at what time it was sampled. And then over here is where you put the facility ID. You get that from Waterlink. And this point code right here. As, as of right now, it only applies to disinfection byproducts, but that's where you put the specific location. Usually it's like MD001, which stands for your midpoint, or MR025 or some number, which stands for your maximum retention or your oldest water. But again, that's only for disinfection byproducts. Highlighted in yellow there, that's where, the first one is where I said earlier, if you had some kid whose his job is simply to deliver the samples or take the samples, that's where he'd put his name and signature. And then down here is where you'd sign to relinquish it to us. So you would, if you deliver them to the lab in person, you wouldn't sign until you're dropping them off. If you're using UPS, you sign right before you, you ship it off. Here's an example of the drinking water chain of custody. It's, it's the same thing with the exception that the tests are pre-filled because there's only a few options that you'd want to use for drinking water testing. Do note that we ask for the, clear, the chlorine residual here. You're supposed to give us a chlorine residual. I know a lot of people don't, but you're supposed to. If you give it to us, we'll pass that information on to the state. Here is an example of a follow-up testing. Suppose that you're your coliform came back positive and you had to go do some repeat sampling. Let's go over quickly what the criteria is. If you get a positive total coliform somewhere, what you need to do is go back to that same site and take another sample. And notice over here, 
You didn't mark them as routine, you marked them as repeat. Routine would have been right here. And you also are going to identify, is this the original location, the upstream, or the downstream? So for every repeat, you have to do the original location within five service locations upstream from that location and within five service locations downstream. And you also have to do what's called a triggered source. Notice this column is triggered source. If you have more than one source, you have to do every source, which makes it really painful if you're a big system. And notice here, not down there, right here, the code for all your repeats is your distribution system. All of your distribution systems have the code DS001. I'm only aware of one example in the state where there's more than one distribution system. But the um, that last one, the SARLAC pit there, the well, that is a code associated with your source because that's your that that's your source. So upstream, downstream, original, and then your source. Okay, let's go over some common errors with chains of custody. Look at this next slide and see if you can see what's wrong with it. Now you're probably thinking, oh, he made a mistake with his PowerPoint. There's no slide there. No, that's intentional. This represents the case where you forget to give me a chain of custody. That's bad for a number of reasons, obviously. We need to know who you are. Second of all, we need to know what test you want. Um, it happens and it requires some detective work. Don't, don't be that person who forgets to put the chain of custody in there. This one is problematic for obvious reasons. You know, Colt, you were talking about, should we use ice or should we use blue ice? This is an example of one that got a little soggy on the bottom. And even if you're using blue ice and, and not the actual ice, condensation happens. When, when we send out bottles, we'll send you a pre-filled chain of custody in a plastic bag. Please use that plastic bag to keep it dry. Um, one of the most important pieces of laboratory equipment is a hair dryer for cases <laughs> like this, because this happens a lot. Um, so yeah, please don't do that. Here's one that has a problem. Take a minute to look at it. If you, if you know the problem, you'll probably get a chuckle. You'll notice here they did not say, should we send it to the state, yes or no? They said, well, send it to the state only if it passes. You can't do that. Colt can verify that's a big no-no. Don't do that. Um, if you're not, if you're doing your bacteria and you're like you're start, starting up for the season, and you're not sure if it's good. Send it in as an investigative sample. Click no, and then instead of doing routine, come down here and mark it as investigative instead of routine. Then if it passes, take another one. But we can't, we can't do what that chain suggests. We'll get in trouble. Yeah, you can't send the investigative as a routine. That's that's been a problem we've had in the past where systems have tried to send us investigatives and say, well, I took it, I just marked it wrong. Well, sorry. Here's an example. Now you might remember the disinfection byproduct bottle that I showed you. It was five little bottles that come in a sandwich baggie. This person thought I need to put one line for each of the five bottles. And that's wrong because we'll, we'll see that and we'll assume that you want five individual tests. And not only will that be expensive, it'll be unnecessary. Remember, all five of those bottles correspond to one sample. So the correct way to do that would be like this, where you've only got the one line and all five bottles correspond to the one test, the disinfection byproducts. Here's an example where somebody was doing volatiles on you know, six different wells, and they thought, well, I'll, I, I guess I need to list it each individual time. And although that's OK and it forms a fun little pattern, it would kind of defeat the purpose of the grid format. So that's that would be a better way to do it is they all need the same test, so just put an X underneath them. Um, the final thing on changes of custody I want to show you, here's an example where somebody did something and they realized I need to scribble that out and fix that because that's not appropriate. Regulators hate scribbles on official documents. The correct way to do that would be a single line crossing out the incorrect information. That way you can see what it was originally, your initials and a date. 
That way you can see who made the cross out when and what the original one was. It's just one of those things that regulators prefer. They, they hate it when you scribble things out. Okay, the final topic and then we'll let you go. Once I've got my report, how do I understand it? How do I know if I passed? So to understand your results, there's three concepts you need to understand. What is a maximum contaminant level? We're going to talk a little bit about units and then something called a method reporting limit. The first one's pretty simple to understand. The EPA's maximum contaminant level is simply the EPA toxicologists got together with the regulators and they determined this is a point at which it starts to become a problem. So you want your result to be below the maximum contaminant level. If you're under that, you're good. If you're not, then you've got a problem you need to discuss with Colt. <laughs> Units. Now, maybe your kid came home from math class and complained, I got the number right, Dad, but my teacher marked off points because I didn't write down the units. That's so stupid. I shouldn't need to do that. Well, you can tell your kid that units matter. Does that taco cost 99 cents or does it cost $99? It's a pretty big difference if you're buying tacos. And same thing applies to, to your report. Now, some of the common units you're going to see are milligram per liter. Most of the uh, maximum contaminant levels are expressed in milligrams per liter, but sometimes you'll see micrograms per liter, which is equivalent to parts per billion with a B instead of parts per million. And occasionally you'll even see parts per trillion, which is nanograms per liter. So here's an example of why units would matter. Suppose that you're monitoring, say, your wastewater for mercury and your limit is 0 0.05. You look at the lab report and it says 523, so you panic. Oh my goodness, did I fail? It depends on the units. Units matter. Now, we have some tests that can show all the way down to the parts per trillion level, nanograms per liter. So if that 523 was nanograms per liter, well, to convert the units, you got to move the decimal point around. So in, in this case, 523, the decimal point is right there, right? So you move it over three places, boom, boom, boom. That corresponds to 0 0.5 parts per billion. And by the same token, move the decimal point over three more places. That corresponds to 0 0.00053 parts per million. So if your regulation is in parts per million, you passed. If it's in one of those other units, maybe you didn't. So the reason I'm stressing on this, if you're using a lab that reports in units, that are not the same as the MCL, you've got to make a conversion. And if you don't know how to convert units, just go to Google and say, how do I convert between this unit and that? It'll, they'll, they'll tell you or call the lab. We're happy to help you with that as well. Okay, now let's talk about the method reporting limit. What that simply means is there's no such thing as zero in chemistry. There's only, we can see down this far. And I, I like to use the example of a seeing eye chart. You know, you go to the doctors and everybody can read the first line. And, you know, maybe some of you, you know, you can read the first line. Most of you can read the second line. And maybe some of you with really good eyesight can see that one. But I doubt anybody's going to be able to read that line. You know something's there, but you can't quite read it. And just for fun, I actually made another line right down there. I, I, I told it to use a super small font. I can't even see it. And so there you go. That, that represents a number of um, types of limits you might see. Like the, the one right there represents what we would call a quantitation limit. We can see there, but we can't really tell for sure what it is. But the important concept I want to put off here is there's always some point below which we can't see it or we're not going to report it. And that, that's called the method reporting limit. So let's put those three concepts into play, looking at an example of a report here. So here's an example of some results that somebody got. Let's start with fluoride. Your result was 0 0.6. 
and the units were milligrams per liter. Now this is one of our reports. We, we're going to put the the units in the same that are used for the maximum contaminant level. Your MCL, your maximum contaminant level was four. Your result was six. You win, yay! You're you're below the maximum contaminant level. Let's look at the example of arsenic down here. You'll notice that your result is highlighted in red because you exceeded the maximum contaminant level. Oh dear, that means you're going to have to take some kind of remediation. It could be as simple as mixing your that source with another water that doesn't fail, or maybe you're going to have to put in a treatment plant. That's where you call the state and have a conversation. Now let's look at nitrate right here. Your result is not a number, it's ND. What does that mean? It means not detected. Doesn't mean zero, it means not detected. This is where that method reporting limit comes into play. So over here, this column right here is a method reporting limit. Our MRL was 0 0.1. We need to make sure that we're less than 10. So in this case, our MRL is less than one. It could be there some value less than that, but we know it's it's at least not greater than 0 0.1. So that's that's below the MRL, we're good. But let's take an example. Suppose you use a lab who didn't know what the limits were and supposed they gave you an MRL of 20. Oh, I have beautiful handwriting, don't I? So if the MRL was 20, and you need to verify that it's less than 10, that's a problem. What if, what if the actual amount of nitrate was 15? Well, 15 is less than 20, therefore it would have been reported as not detect. And you've got a problem. You're not, you're not verifying that you've met that maximum contaminant level. So that's what you need to be aware of. Um, whenever you're doing testing, you need to make sure the lab is aware of what your detection limit requirements are. And we're almost done. There's just a few more reports I want to go over. Here's an example of a bacteria report. They don't have maximum contaminant levels because it's either present or it's absent. Absent is good because you want bacteria to not be there. Present would be bad. Occasionally we have people who want a slightly more sophisticated number, what we call enumerated which we can do, it's, it's a little bit extra cost, but um, it's not required, but some people do. And here you'll see the result is less than one. If there's one, if there's more than one, then that would be the same as present, less than one is the same as absent. So that's how you would read. If you're one of those few people who ask for the enumerated version rather than present absent. Okay, if you're still awake, the last slide, represents the radiological data. It's a little bit different, so it's a little tricky. Now, on the radiological data, there are these parameters right here. The LLD is kind of a de their detection limit and the variance after report an error type of a thing. Those don't, aren't really of much value to you, so let's just ignore those. The ones that matter are the ones that don't say LLD or variance. On gross alpha, your result was 11 picocuries per liter, and you had to be below 15 and you are, so that's good. This one right here, radium 226, you may or may not get that on your report. We only ask, and by the way, no one in the state of Utah does radiologicals. We subcontract those out to somewhere else. If your gross alpha is less than five, then we don't ask the subcontract lab to do radium-226. We only do that if it's greater than five, and in this case it was. So we look at it, our result is 2.9, and the MCL is five, and so we might be standing up and dancing a jig, grateful that we passed. However, radiologicals has that one trick that you're gonna have to be aware of, that five is actually a combined radium. So it's the sum of the radium 228 and the 226. So in this case, we 
tricked you into a sense of false security. What you need to do is add those two numbers together. In this case, 4 plus 2.9 is greater than 5. So unfortunately, this, this system failed their radiologicals. That's the only one where you have, that I'm aware of where you have to add two numbers together, but do be aware of that. And so this is another case where you call the state and say, okay, what do, what do I have to do? Okay, folks, thanks for listening. That is everything you need to know or everything I'm going to tell you today, at least. Sounds good. That's all, folks. Oh, I'm trouble from copyright infringement now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Reed, for coming in. Uh, thank you all for being patient with us as we make this shift. I promise you the webinar program is going to continue and it is going to grow and be better. Uh, Reed, this is great to have, especially some of that refresher information. We get a lot of questions on this from new systems and from new operators, as well as systems who just haven't ever uh, had some of this presented to them so cleanly and concisely. And let me reinforce, don't hesitate to call the lab. I know we're not associated with the state, but we we do a lot of educating of new, new operators, so it's, it's not a burden. Just feel free to call us. Yep, maintain one of the pieces of advice I always give to a water system is to have a call sheet of who their contacts are at the lab, what lab they use in case someone new comes in to take over that system. Uh, they can call and ask what they're due on and how to start get started with the water system and oh, maintaining a good relationship with whichever lab you're using is really important. So again, thank you all for tuning in and we will have information out to you about how to attend our next webinar and how it will be different. Thank you.